Cheers, Bye. Cheers, Ken. Bye. So, welcome to episode, what number of episode is it, Simon? Uh, lucky 13, I think. I was going to say, I think it's 13, isn't it? Yes, it's 13. Well, we have a special guest today, and that is Mr. Matthew Last. Hello, Matthew. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Thank you for inviting me to number 13. I, I hope there's no <laughs> meaning behind that. Yeah, this is where it all goes downhill. Oh. <laughs> we lose our yeah. four fans and that's it. Yeah. Um, well, we've lost one of them because you're one of our fans and, and so there's going to be three people going to watch this. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm definitely a fan. I'm a groupie. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that, that explains a lot. Yeah. Um, so, uh, why, Matthew, why don't you start off by telling us who you are and what is your karate history briefly okay briefly so i am um, i i am matthew last i live in cambridge i'm a i'm a member of simon's dojo which is probably one of the nearest for me to train in but um i i've done karate since i was 45 and i'm now 63 so i started late i did a year as an undergraduate uh, when I was at university, but there were other temptations. I I, I graded to seventh Q actually back in the seventies. I got Andy Sherry, Terry O'Neill, and Billy Higgins' signature in my book for my three wow. gradings. Yeah, what? yeah. But uh, that was at Lancaster University back in the seventies. I, I gave up basically because I had other distractions. It was a sex and drugs and rock and roll period of my life. Let's put it that way. And then I tried tried it again a couple of times in, the, in my 30s in the in the KUGB club in the in the Cambridge University but they weren't particularly pleasant you know I was you know it was a bit bollock and bite and and then when I was 45 my wife Jane said there's a new karate club starting in Cambridge run by a chap called Dharma Vera who you both know uh, Brian Duff Scottish guy um, run on sort of on Buddhist principles basically so I joined that and fell completely in love with it and um Dharma Vera was teaching a 70s, 80s karate. And then, but he knew you, Scott Sensei, and he said, I'm going to get this guy Scott in. And then, to his great credit, because he doesn't have much ego, he said, Look, this guy is completely in a different league. We're going to switch associations. And we did. And um, we, you know, and, and it, the rest is history, as it were. I, I was sort of secretary and, and treasurer and organizer of that Cambridge club that we set up after Dharma Vera left for years but it sort of stumbled on because I wasn't I didn't have the time to run it you know I, I wasn't even a showdown in those in those days and also um we had teachers like Bill Rogers who I'm a huge fan of but he doesn't particularly like teaching children and those sorts of things and then but we we, we carried on and I, I did do my showdown with you uh, Scott Sensei in Ireland when I was 50 after five years and then I stumbled on for about another 12 years and then did my knee down with you in um, 2019, which was an interesting experience. So probably the toughest thing I've ever done, particularly as I discovered the week after that I had advanced prostate cancer. So that was quite, I wondered why I was in pain doing the grading. And, now I, and then I discovered why. So that's me. Um, in terms of current uh, karate status, um, I love training on Zoom with you guys. I train uh, Waisty as much as I can, but I also train with the local JKA club who have just left OTA and joined the Kawazoe fraction. So that's quite interesting. And I train with a very East Anglian group called Eska who are um, Kanazawa fans. It hasn't, it, what can I say? It's, it's still Kanazawa karate. Um, so I, tra I train with those three you three, and then I occasionally train with the KUGB at the university when I've got the energy. So I'm a bit of a um, itinerant, really. Very good. And tell us what is your job? Tell us professionally what you do. Yeah. Sorry, I I, um, I'm, I might be the one talking too much here. Actually, not the not not the other person who was named. Um, so I run a company. Have done for um, thirty years. We work with boards, executive teams, leadership teams on a uh, team basis but also individually so I have a team of people working for me and I do it myself and we 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 do something called team alignment which is that most senior teams are not aligned they're not aligned around what they're trying to achieve they're not aligned around how they do that and they're not aligned around behaviors so it all goes pear-shaped when there are complicated questions so that's fascinating and then I also work one-to-one -one with people I've been doing it a long time so for me bringing that perspective to watching karate associations is quite interesting. There's a, there's a PhD in it somewhere, isn't there? 
Yeah. So, I mean, like that, that was, uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, we're friends. So that's one of the reasons why we thought it'd be a good idea for you to come on board. So I think for a professional, uh, your professional verdict verdict of, of karate, the state of karate, the state of karate politics and associations, organizations, yeah. um, really, I think it would be quite a good idea to get your perspective on on those sort of things. But I'm feeling Simon Sensi is a bit a bit quiet today. Strangely right? quiet. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is there anything you want to jump in first, Simon Sensi, before we I, get Yeah, I just, as soon as you mentioned a Karate Club on Buddhist principles, I thought all the few people who watch it would go, oh, no, they've got another one of them on. <laughs> no. no, no, because, because um, it... it it, it, the Buddhists all left basically over time, and then it ended up being other people, including um, a few characters who were headbangers basically, and uh, you know, quite rough. And but that was quite good in a way because um, one of them, Pete, uh, who you know was really, really hard on me, but was instrumental in forcing me to get my show down because it was like, I'll show you basically so in a, in a backhanded way I can compliment him but yeah I don't think there were any Buddhists left by the time I uh, by, by the time I folded the club up because we, we you know we, we weren't really going very well. I mean um, my, my other point was I mean I'm sure and this might be your question Scott are we going to talk about what, what's your take on the politics of karate organizations? Yeah Matthew so what, what's your professional take on the state yeah. of uh, of karate organizations? Well let's, let's start with let's start with what do you think is the main issues that karate organizations have in a generic sense? Let's not name names. Well, I, I think I, I work with organizations, I groups, and I work with individuals a lot. So I, you know, there's a lot of psychological training and basis to what I have. And because I'm working with groups, I see all those interactions as well. I think that one of the is, issues with karate clubs is they're a bit, or I think martial arts clubs probably generically is, they're a little bit like churches in the sense that, you know, they're not like bowling clubs where, where people can rock up and bowling is only part of their life. For some people, karate or martial arts is their life and they can adopt a sense of tribalism and orthodoxy and burning of heretics. And um, when they're businesses as well, I think that can compound it because it adds a little bit of sort of fuel to the fire. And when they're run by people who don't have much organizational management experience, then that also compounds it as well. And then I think the additional flavor is you get, and I've noticed this, is a perverted sense of what it should be like if you were Japanese. You know, so there's so a lot of British clubs I've trained in, you know, they, they try and adopt a Japanese approach to things, but they've not, they don't understand what that means. For example, I don't think they understand the mutual obligations between senpai and kohai they you know they they adopt a, a dictatorial and autocratic approach and sometimes it's really quasi abusive i would say and but bill rogers and i and you know bill rogers and i train with him once or twice a week privately you know he and i were joking that about how many people we've known who are actually in jail for for being naughty uh, we, we could think of at least two and there's a, possibly one coming up and, and of course, because there aren't the constraints on behaviors in martial arts that there are in, in most organizations, you know, because they're subject to market forces or regulation. And when I, when I first started training with Dharma Vera, we had a couple of women Nidans turn up and they were training in a club in Suffolk. The sensei did two things that were, that were quasi illegal. Firstly, he used to turn the heating up in the hall and then train everybody until only one was standing because the rest had fainted. And the other thing he did was he got everybody to subscribe. He got everybody to put a lot of pressure on people to pay money to build a dojo in a barn next to his house that he said would be collectively owned. And then when it was done, it turned out that he owned it and everybody else had to sod off. You know, I mean, that, that, that form of abuse is rampant, isn't it, really, in yeah. some areas, not others. And, and would you and, say... Would you, would you say, like, like, not only within a, like, because maybe sometimes dojos are just kind of a, a smaller version of an organization. What happens within a dojo and the dynamics that are there uh, plays out on a bigger national or even international uh, yeah. level, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Because, because you, you know, when you get human beings together, you get some fairly predictable behaviors around people's need for affiliation, for, um, for validation. You get people playing hierarchy. 
you get people who are the high priesthood of the rules you get people who are rebellious within that context and people who are conformist in that context you get um you know, since when did a downgrading give you any people skills, for example? Yeah. There's no correlation. I, I, I live in Cambridge. I spend my life working with people who've got PhDs who suddenly run companies and think they can do management because they've got a PhD. There's zero correlation, frankly. The only, the only redeeming feature is that they're bright. But, you know, you get people running martial arts clubs and they have no concept of management. And they have this perverted Japanese view of it as well. So... It can be quite interesting. I, I think well, your point about sensei is quite good. I mean, because yeah. people, sensei is a bit like, I think we said this the other week, you know, people have an image of this, their idea of a Japanese sensei. So if you're loyal to your sensei, like Cobra Kai style, yeah. you build them a house. Yeah. You, you know, you, you, you worship your sensei. A bit like, a, you know, remember uh, uh, Bagwish, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, the um, Sigurdgram Bag. Rajnish, who had Rajnish Purim, ended up with 72 Rolls Royces. Yeah. And people just became, he became a guru to people. He built a big ashram in Pune. Then he moved to America and got done for tax. You yeah. know, Bikram Yoga, Bikram Yoga, the That's same true. sort of thing. He branded yeah. his version of yoga, hot yoga. He, he, he modeled it all in dog with it. This is how you do it. You could only learn it from him. Massive franchise. Absolutely. And then he abused all his, all his pupils. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I've done a lot of personal development, professional development stuff over the years, NLP, transactional analysis, you know, dozens of these tools and techniques, which are all very, very useful. But many of them are revelationary for the people if it's their first exposure to that sort of thing. So they, they tend to view it as the truth, capital T, capital T. And then you get this sense of the leader must be a demigod, essentially. And you, and you see those relationships become very, very odd so I, I did an nlp course once and it was a week long and the, and there were a group in the, who who um, one of them had the job of taking the front row early and putting their books on it it was like you know the stereotype of the germans and the tales you know and and i i sat in one of them once because i was feeling particularly mischievous and i got into trouble and i said you don't own these seats oh no no we've got to sit near him it's like why <laughs> honestly and I, you know i do see a bit of that in martial arts because I think also there's the money thing, you know, so for example, you know, in, in Kendo, for example, which, you know, I've done a bit of Kendo, there's, there's no, there's the British Kendo Association, they're affiliated to the Japanese Kendo Association, and there's no styles, and there's no money in Kendo, no. I mean, they've got all politics as well, but that's more like village green type politics that we saw, but because there's no money in it, there's far less sort of factualism, yeah. so that they're, they're not fractured so much. And judo tends to be the British Judo Association. There's a British Judo Council, sort of slightly one, but there's no money in judo. No, so I think, no. you know, taekwondo and karate and kung fu are millions of small businesses to some extent. Yes, they are. And if you get 500 students, you know, there's an income in that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Bill, Bill told me the other day that um, Dave Hazard's philosophy is I have a maximum of 500 pupils and it's one in, one out when I get to that. And they're my rules and I'm in charge. And if you don't like it, you can F off. Yeah. And it's a very simple system. And actually, uh, you can see merit in that. Um, Until you don't have 500 students and then yeah. <laughs> and you get a bit desperate. But it's all well, about connection though, isn't it? Like it's about that kind of like um, kind of village mentality. Like how many people can you be intimately yeah. connected with? And the average hunter gatherer is 120 people because psychologically that's the only yeah. that's the maximum amount of people you can know. So yeah, yeah I mean like yeah. 120 people out of 500 organization is 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 all the senior grades and all the brown belts. Correct. And and in a, in um Charles Handy, Professor Charles Handy did some work on why churches were having sort of little mini schisms, you know, uh, arguments about angels on a pinhead and breaking up at about 50. And he reckoned it's the, it's the number of relationships that people yeah. can hold. And here in, here in my, because I work with startups, they change character radically between somewhere between 40 and 60 people. There are, there are other factors like architecture and pace of market change and so on. But 50 is a really interesting number. There's another one at around 500, then there's possibly some along the way. There's also uh, the pain of the Baptist church. I was in one of the states, I drove through Alabama, yeah. and every you went, there was millions of little Baptist church. Yeah. And I said to Jane, who was driving me, I said, why is there so many? And apparently the Southern Baptists have a rule. Once you have 15 people in your congregation, 
they've got to go and open another church. Is that right? Okay. A bit so, like Go Can Roo, they do that. You know, when you get to a certain grade that you're told to, you know, literally evangelical approach to karate. It is going to be interesting for the HDKI because it will hit some of these thresholds. You know, it's like a step function, isn't it? Yeah. You, you grow rapidly and then it plateaus about how exercise, uh, sorry, how leadership is exercised, how how that sort of um, culture is, is, is kept going. I'm, I'm a beekeeper as well, as you both know. And, you know, bee, beehives exist because there's enough queen pheromone distributed for the, for the bees to know who's in charge. And when it gets too big, and, and when they walk past the queen, they lick her in order to get some of the pheromone. Now, I was thinking about this relative to St. <laughs> Scott, you know, That's very good. exuding a I queen pheromone. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the interesting thing about bees is the queen is in charge. She's just a big, thick egg layer, you see. So the, the analogy breaks down quite quickly here. Right. But um, it, is, it is interesting. You know, as all these new clubs joining, you know, if there is a flood of KUGB clubs, as, 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 uh, as you might suspect, you know, they bring in a very different culture, yeah. a very different uh, set of sort of operating principles. And, and what's the negotiation there? I mean, it's, it, I'm, I'm going to observe with great interest. I, mean, I think, I think um, like that's, that's not only playing out kind of in the UK at the moment with the, the KUGB clubs that have come on board uh, and possibly will come on board. It's also kind of playing out on an international level as well, you know, so we have similar issues in, in other countries. But yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we can, it'd be interesting to see what your, your thoughts are about that. But like, what, what, do you think, what do you think is the main reason why people capitulate to this type of stuff? Uh, and so some people will... Some people will kind of, you know, go underneath the the, the, the kind of suppressive nature of, of these kind of dictators and other people's will, people will rebel. And like we would obviously be, a lot of people within the HDK are those rebellious type, yeah. although that's slowly changing when you talk about that. But why do you think people kind of succumb to that? Oh, I, I would apply very similar models to the karate world as I would to the organisational world. You know, pe people are driven by core emotions. You know, there are six, psychologists can't quite agree, but there are six or seven core emotions that drive behaviors because it's primal brain stuff. So fear, um, um, avoidance of pain, uh, joy, um, love, um, uh, distaste, these sorts of things drive people. And, and, when, and when you, if you adopt a sort of very Jungian approach that your personality is formed in the first seven years of your life and it becomes a sort of operating system, Lots of people are running narratives or drivers around their relationships to others that are from their first period of their life. So, so when when somebody exercises power and authority, a lot of people go back to childlike behaviors. And if you use a transactional analysis model, you know, there's a compliant child or there's a rebellious child, for example. You know, so you get parent adult child behaviors playing out in karate dojos. You get victim, persecutor, rescuer triangle behaviors playing out in karate dojos you get people um pe people's um people in human beings are stimulus response mechanisms you know so a, a look or a or a comment or a tone of voice from a senior person can tip somebody into a childlike behavior now is that a, an up yours rebellious child or is it a compliant child or is it a compliant child who is actually um, rebellious behind the scenes because you get that going on you know what i try and teach people and i try and practice myself is an adult response to things but as you as you know um be, being adult is difficult at the best of times and it's difficult to be like it 100 percent of the time particularly when you've got hierarchy you know i mean i i i'm, I'm we are friends, but also, you know, your senior grades to me, one day you're going to grade me again. You know, there's, there's these shifting relationships that mm -hmm. somebody like me can cope with because I'm 63 years old and, you know, and, and facing my mortality as it were and so on. So I can, I can do that, but many people can't. So they revert to childhood drivers and they don't know what they are. That's the problem because they're unconscious, they're not able to deal with them. So I'm a believer that emotional intelligence is the answer to most things you see. So Scott, can I ask you a question on this then? I mean, I'm thinking when I was a, uh, a member of an organisation, when you were in the IJKA coming through the ranks, were you ever concerned about the, the politics of it or where the IJKA stood in the world and all the wrangling with Japan? 
But were you aware well, of it, or did you? I mean, I was, you know, I, I wasn't aware of any of it and didn't care for many for a long, long time. When I was um, before, See, I went, when you were 17, 18, 19, <laughs> going in your pump, you were you bothered? Were you even? Did you ever worry about that? Not, not really. I mean, like, like you sometimes, I think the vast majority of people um, on a in a in a dojo who are like just not hobbyists or or just coming through the grades, they're, they're not really concerned about the the positioning of the or the, the 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 dojo that they belong to the dojo's positioning within a national or an international uh, organizational setup right but i think i think what is interesting though is that whatever's playing out on a national or an international level is also probably playing out on a regional or micro level yeah. right so yeah, yeah, what's yeah. happening within the local so there was politics within i was in malton between york and scarborough training there and and you know the bigger dojo was in york and there was politics between the malton dojo and the york dojo and, and you know i so the the guy who taught uh, howard nelson who, who was my original instructor he was senior to um the the guy who taught in in york and but the the malton dojo was smaller and the york dojo was bigger but i was his top student and i was kind of coming through and all these things came to kind of came crashing down on me and i used to get a really hard time every time i went yeah. to, to the york dojo which actually helped me a lot because it pushed me forward but mm. I didn't understand at the time. I just thought they hate, everyone hated me. You know, right. so, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, like, all these things kind of play out. So whether you, I think you're concerned about the international standing of a group or or the regional standing of the group, it's all the same, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I've had some conversations this week with people, and the first thing they say to me is, oh, I, don't, I, I hate politics. I don't want to get involved in the politics. And it's a bit like, well, you know, life is politics. <laughs> really? And when my coaching clients say that, I say, look, it's there. Yeah. The question is whether you choose to deal with it or not. I, I can give you tools to empower you to deal with it. Let's not use the word politics because it's pejorative. Let's talk about how influential are you? How do you manage relationships? How do you manage your internal brand within this organization? Normally, people will come around to it. And there's some interesting studies that, you know, people, people who are influential in organizations network and they spend time talking to other people. People who aren't influential avoid it, disparage it, and think there's a set of rules that they can abide by, and then are very surprised when there's actually this under, undercurrent set of rules that are plain as the nose on the end of your face if you if you choose to look at them. Yeah. I think yeah. also, you know, you talk about the like the the, the people who you know, think of karate as a way of life, and the other people who just do it twice a week. And every organisation kind of needs those people, you know, who like you know, in, in Buddhist terms, it's like the community, you know, they're, they're the, yeah. the sangha, the people who just support the cause. Yeah. And a lot of them really don't care, you know, like, you yeah. know. They don't. And they, they, they're they looking for, um, you know, if, if, if that's, I mean, then in a way that's a healthy activity, isn't it? Because that's like turning up at the bowling club. You, you, you yeah. go bowling. It's not what would be called identity level. But hmm. for somebody who's at a, um, uh, for whom it's a way of life, then, you know, the slightest slight is akin to, ha you know, hovering over them with a dagger, isn't it? Because it's an yeah. existential yeah. threat. Yeah. Um, especially when, and when money gets involved money and ego is a quite an interesting cocktail isn't it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i um i love watching it i mean I, scott said something interesting about hdki attracts people who are a little bit more rebellious and i think that's right i think well, yeah i i think it, it it does it has done it it continues to but i think also like i'm very aware as as the as the HDKI becomes a recognizable brand, I don't know, I don't want to really use the term brand, but certainly a recognizable name or, or you know, something that kind of people yeah. have a certain kind of uh, understanding of what we are, then, then people then just buy into it. And as soon as you buy into it, then you kind of take away all that kind of, uh, I don't know, rebelliousness, right? So you, and then we start attracting people who have bought into that brand. Uh, and so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, like we've talked, you, you mentioned it, but like moving forward, I mean, well, what do you, what do you think, Matthew, is, is the is the answer to a successful group? Well, I, I both think on a, both, yeah. sorry, both on a, a national, but also international stand, uh, standing. Well, I think I, I, I actually reflected on this because I, because I realized that you asked me to think about politics, but politics and leadership are um, you know, two sides of the same coin. And at the moment, there is a model where where you're very central to it, uh, Scott Sensei. Um, but over time, you know, 
the queen bee pheromone doesn't distribute uh, particularly when it gets international yeah so i think you're already doing some of the things you need to do like distributed leadership um i wonder whether that I, I notice it in action, but because I'm not part of the conversation, I don't know how conscious and planned it is. And that, that would be a sort of recommendation is to think about how could that leadership be distributed? And then what type of leadership do we expect? Because if you distribute it and then you end up with an autocrat in one corner of the empire, then that's going to be problematic. Um, you know, especially if, and, and we've seen people already in the HDGI come and go with quite interesting concepts of what leadership is and and their and their rights you know well i'm 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 i've, I've been running this club for 20 years you've got to make me fifth dan what well, you know, those sorts of things i think there's something about um i would i do work with tj tk max whose parent company is called tgx they are a really interesting fascinating organization and and they had a they had a model where they had what were called tri tribal elders who went around the organisation. So guys who'd retired had been very senior, or guys and women who'd retired would be very senior, and they sort of held the flame of the culture and the values, and they're very strong in TJX. And I do wonder whether there's an argument about who are going to be the tribal elders in the HDKI. Yeah, um, and that may not be just a function of your downgrade. Okay, it's a function of your wisdom, and and some young people are wisdom, you know, are wise, wiser than some old people, you know, uh, as you know. Um, I think there's something about, you know, there is a, if we go back to the religious piece, there is a bit of a creed in in the HDKI, isn't it? You know, it's 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 openness. You know, you're not saying you can't train with anybody else, and you like to bring in people from other martial arts and from other uh, other disciplines, and you're always saying to people, be curious and experiment, but at the moment, I want. At the moment, that's the pheromone is distributing. But I wonder whether the creed is something that needs to be written down and made more explicit. Um, and then I think, and lockdown has exacerbated this. You know, a lot of groups hold together because of sim. You know, we, you, you've studied social anthropology. You've studied philosophy. I've studied comparative religion. You know, we we all know the power of ritual, symbol seasonality um event sticks you know we, we we know that people pass through things you know it's no accident that all civilizations have their equivalent of birth and death and christenings and bar mitzvahs and and all these sorts of things and i wonder whether the, the christmas course and all those sorts of things used to do all of that and with with you you guys traveling around as well but i wonder again whether that needs a bit of putting on the table and thinking about how do we keep that going because it can't be ad hoc anymore um, yeah that's my I don't think I, yeah i think i think well there's lots of i think the the idea of the elders is a, is a great idea yeah. um i mean but because like ultimately you know i'm thinking well like i'm 48 now and really i always had that in the back of my mind that like by the time i was mid 50s i would be taking a significant step back uh, because I, I think I think people are quite innovative and, and really have the energy to push forward in like the 30s and 40s. So I always thought that someone someone who's the head, not the head like like yeah like technical chief technical director whoever should be someone who's in maybe in the 40s you yeah. know who are kind of energetic skilled blah blah blah. So by the time I get to 55 or maybe another you know 55 late 50s whatever taking a step back and 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 then yeah having that sense and, and others around like simon and but also like you say like much more a meritocracy based on rather than based on skills that you can give rather than skills that you've been given as in i'm a seventh and i'm an eighth yeah. uh, so that's a really good idea um and, Sorry. well I was, gonna, I was gonna say and yeah it is something that not only it's it's yeah it's a conscious decision about how we are distributing um uh, kind of like I, I'm, I'm very much trying to make sure that i'm not micromanaging any place uh there's sometimes like you, yeah you're right sometimes there's an issue then sometimes you know people will start making decisions that you think oh that's not really how i would do it but because we have those guiding principles yeah because we have the that that sense that you know when we haven't got a, 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 a objective or an aim, but we've got these principles. So, you know, if they make a decision, are they fulfilling the principles of tradition and innovation and cooperation? And uh, what's the other one? Kindness. No. 
<laughs> well, yeah, teach karate, be kind. Yeah, do good karate, be kind. And, and I'm sure. striking adventures. Yeah, but like, but like that, yeah, but also we have those kind of, <laughs> that was a very strong carver. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, vision, innovation, collaboration, and oh, I can't remember. I'm sorry, I didn't read these as my homework. I clearly should have done. <laughs> I'm um, gonna Google it. I'm gonna Google, Google it. Google it. I, I, I think the um, the interesting question is going to come, isn't it? When somebody doesn't play by the uh, written and unwritten principles, what are you going to do about it? And who is going to do that? You know, is that down to Scott? You know, are you got down to, to Scott? Yeah, Scott pulls the trigger. Sorry, okay, I'm back. Tradition, oh. innovation, respect, and collaboration. Oh. <laughs> that's why we've forgotten it yeah <laughs> i'm sure yeah. lots of people think we're very disrespectful yeah but like, like so, so my point my sorry my point was before i forgot my own, own principles that i created was like like you know all your like the the good thing about that is that i can always go to someone who's who i can see has made a decision uh and say okay you've got the authority to make that decision but are you thinking about these four yeah. elements of, and do you fulfill that criteria rather than giving them a hard and fast rule give them hard and fast principles to, yeah, to yeah, make yeah. Decisions. it's inevitable that there will be a breakaway it's just people isn't it yeah it's just yeah. totally inevitable that's what well, people is do, inevitable? You know? i mean like because my idea is that as long the only time that people break away is when they're not getting enough money mm. and because because we're not if yeah. if we're in a, a model of sustainable growth and then people get to the point where they are kind of needing to earn money professionally, yeah. whatever they need to do, then we can facilitate that. It's not as if we're trying to forever keep the same amount of, you know, percentage of, of wealth that the, the organisation creates. Well, I think it's just statistically inevitable. That's, you know, I don't think it's any reflection on us. Yeah. I just think people do that thing because that's what people do, because they I want to be the boss. I think the thing about words like innovation and respect and, and fun and adventure, though, is they're quite sophisticated um, concepts in the sense that you, you require people to understand them, to have thought about them and be willing to practice them. And we come back to my point about emotional intelligence. And, and I find in my business and organizational life, you know, some profoundly intelligent and educated people are very low on EI, very low. And therefore, they don't have the same baseline of what innovation or respect means, you know, because these are very, very can of worms types of concepts. So I think those, those principles are continual works in progress mm -hmm. as the organization, as HTKI grows. They're, they're constantly having to be revisited and reviewed and sort of inculcated in a way so that people can develop and learn and begin to understand what respect means because no, respect is a bit like mother of an apple pie you know nobody who does a martial art is going to say i don't believe in respect but what does respect mean to person a compared with person b because you know i i've I, I, even i'm guilty of it you know you walk into a dojo is respect that i don't because i'm a dan grade talk to junior grades well i don't think so but some people do yeah you know or they don't talk to me mm. you know I mean, I'm, I've talked to anybody, as you know, so I'll march up and talk to anybody. But, but I do have a sense of what respect would be when either of you two are senior to me are, are busy or something. But some people are too deferential and some people are not, not deferential. But also, yeah, there's also that thing, you know, we talk yeah. about happy karate, you know, yeah. and a lot of people hate that because it's the idea that happy karate can somehow be shoddy karate. Yeah. So, you, you know, you don't need to be, you know, we can be serious when we train, but you can have a, you know, you can, you know, you talk Scots so, so much better than happy karate and sad karate. I posted something of Paul Urensense, he did a great little uh, techie no kata. He had a nice mix of te techie shoulder and yeah, knee down, really yeah. nice. And then straight away someone posted, up, you know, the, uh, this is wrong, techie kata should not be done like that. And then someone I don't know said, why? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, yeah, why? And never replied. Because I think, you know, I think some people maybe lack the imagination or just see this image of, you know, the, living the samurai nonsense. Yeah. Uh, we are sensei and, you know, you need, and it's a empty words again. It's a meme, isn't it? It's a whole yeah. thing about karate should be this. We're all on a journey, but there's no, there's nothing behind it. I, uh, one of the words I bang on about when in my organizational life is, are you curious? 
the, and yeah. a lot of people are not. Um, yes. and, the re and the reason they're not sometimes is because they're scared or sometimes because actually they they like to live by rules. You know, if we think of all the different personality types and, you know, and I've had some training in that. Some people are innately adventurers and explorers and some people turn up and say, tell me what the rules are. And it's yeah. very unsettling if, if you've got almost too many opportunities, too much right. choice. Correct. Like, you know, like if, if you show three different ways to you do hip drive, maybe some people are overwhelmed by that. Well, you yeah. even hear that when um, Scott Sensei is on Zoom, you hear it in some of the questions, people saying, what is the way, capital T, capital H, capital E, to do something? And Scott, of course, loves these questions because he refuses to give a definitive answer. And, and, but he makes it just about definitive enough that a person can hear what they want to hear. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting because there isn't a definitive answer sometimes. Is it because, you know, karate, karate is, I'm beginning to realize, you know, a very fluid thing. And, well, you know, it, well, I mean, when we went to, I came to Japan with you, as you know, I was slightly dismayed as the lack of curiosity of some of our colleagues into the cultural background and the, and the, and the, and the sort of provenance, if you like, of karate and the difference with Okinawa. But that, I mean, maybe that's just me and I'm a bit different, but to me, everything is contextual. You know, I think when I'm there, sometimes I'm thinking like we're in the Budokan. I'm going to look at them going, you're in the Budokan. This is like amazing. Yeah. Do, you, do you realize that we're training here? You know, this is a yeah. big deal. Yeah, or, yeah, you I know, know, we're training yeah. at the Heutzigen. This is the, it's, yeah. I, you're definitely right. In, in the I can't now. go anywhere without understanding the historical, geographical, political, human yeah. dimensions of it. I feel completely unanchored. This is why I could never go on a cruise ship, you know, because mm, it's just yeah. like you, you're there for 10 minutes and then you bugger off and all you're doing is seeing a new set of gift shops. You know, I mean, that's a bit rude of me to say that, but that's not- No, me. I agree with you, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was fascinated by the cultural difference between Okinawa and Japan, mm. basically. And I would love to explore that further because that's more than the difference between the English and the Scottish, for example. But well, that also explains the cultural differences between Okinawan karate and yeah. Japanese karate. Yeah. You know, the Okinawans think the Japanese, you know, Japanese karate is like a bit mad. Yeah. It's too, you know, just it's it's like too, too hard, too macho, too 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 uh, too full on. You know, in Okinawa, you train a bit, you have a cup of tea, it's hot. You smile, hit the macawara. I mean, I, I, if I were much younger and starting again and knew what I knew now, I'd probably do either Okinawan. Con karate or aikido okay. because of their uh, yeah, yeah I, I think i think if you were young and starting again my advice would be you do japanese karate and the and the and the older you get the more south you go you start yeah. with japanese karate yeah. and then you go to okinawan karate and you finish with chinese form spot on spot interesting on. Well, that, i agree Bill Rogers and I are, you know, because Bill is now 70 and I'm 63 and we're training together a couple of times a week and we are working out how to do old man's karate, basically, because his, yeah. he, as you know, he died twice in the ambulance after a motorcycle accident and I have my problems and um, we're trying to work out how to do effortless flowing karate. So we're, we're both a bit obsessed by working out how Steve Ubel does it at the moment. So we're looking at all the videos and comparing notes, of course, because it's all inside, you can't quite work it out sometimes, can you? <laughs> and I don't have his eye, you know, I don't have a discerning eye. But yeah. I'm yeah, thinking, I'm looking at the time. I'm just going to, can, can we do a change of pace? Can I ask you a question, Scott? Yes. Is that all right, Matt? Because Matthew's worked hard, loads of good stuff there. So yes. I loved your post this week on Instagram saying you don't need to be the greatest, but you should be speech. Could we go over that again? Because I think that fits in quite well with your start north and go south. Would you mind? No, so what so I, I said, I was very pointy finger. It was very good. It's right, in the, very up, right up my street. So don't forget, it fits in where you know if you can do that, you do it the easy way or the hard way. Do the hard way. Yeah, yeah. Which I yeah. often quote. So what I said was that you don't have to be the best in the world, but if you're a forty-year-old bloke, then the, be the best forty-year-old bloke that you know. Be the fittest and strongest 40 for your 40 year old bloke in your peer group group if you're a, a 70 year old granny then be the fittest strongest 70 year old granny in your peer group and you don't have to aim for kind of like the the best because that's unattainable uh, there's always going to be someone better than you but you should be the best person the fittest strongest healthiest person that you know within your demographic that's basically what i said and i was trying to make the point that karate is is paid for in sweat equity 
that you, you is not something like uh, like I Nick Simon says his line, which is you know karate Shotokan karate, especially is the is the most catalogued uh, um, uh, style of all martial arts, and as a result, we kind of tend to move to this kind of academic cerebral uh, approach to studying and it's not it's it's they they help and they kind of pr produce kind of like landmarks you can aim for but ultimately karate is sweat equity and you better be the fittest strongest person that you know within your demographic that's basically what i said in yeah. a very fitting way no i loved it and i'm going to use that as in future and try and find out a way to share it from instagram but this leads me to my other question of go back to you matthew is that, you know, I saw you training for Nidan, doing your Nidan grading, which was great. But I mean, where has your new enthusiasm come from post Nidan? You well, just seem to have just gone I am, like evangelical on it. Yeah? I am. I've completely fallen in love with it. I mean, I am quasi obsessed. Um, to yeah. the point where my work is getting in the way. Um, <laughs> why? Well, um, why, yeah. why, why, why? Um, because... Um, because I have the time, I think, or I've chosen to have the time, you know, because I'm, because if, if my cancer comes back, I'm in, I'm in deep trouble and I probably wouldn't be able to do karate, let alone do anything else. So I feel in a hurry. There's partly that. Secondly, I've, I think I've unlocked the key a bit. And that might be because I'm working with Bill in terms of what I need to do. Some, somebody, you know, I said to a lot of people, I didn't think I deserved my knee down. And, and, and a lot of people said to me, we, some people grow into it. And I realized I'm, I might be one of those. And I think I've now, I now do things and they work. And I now do things and I, th and I relate something I did on Tuesday with something I did on Thursday, or I take a principle I've learned in one class and I apply it to a cater I'm doing. And I've never done that before. It was always very formulaic and very, very hard and very, very frustrating. And, you know, I think I got through my knee down grading just through, through sheer willpower. No, well, just as a caveat to that, Scott Sensen, I saw him his knee down grading and he was in front of about 100 or so people in Denmark. Massive course, open to everybody, you know, big, full on, big old grading, lots of down grades and stuff. Right. And, you know, the guy you did your knee down with failed and you passed and it was not an easy grading, was it? Uh, well, I... I seem, I seem, uh, when I did my showdown, I had to fight a six foot tall 16 year old who had a, who had a Mawashi Gary that would go a foot over my head. So the only way I could fight him was by getting close and scaring the living daylights out of him. And for my knee down, I had to fight Rue, you know, who's what, 26 and whip it, you know, yeah. so again, I just had to, I just had to keep going at him regardless of how much he hit me. I just had to hit him more. And, you know, so there was that, but no, I, I, why have I fallen in love with it? It's, it's, I'm fascinated by it physically because I'm I'm not good at sports. You have to understand. I have to work very very hard at them. I'm uh, intrigued by. You know, I have a sense of what is behind the door in terms of being able to do it well. You know, so Scott says he was talking about doing sand down the other day and about flow and and moves moving into each other. I'm thinking, I think I'm just about beginning to grasp what that means. Bill is teaching me to move fast and without effort and uh, he's really really good and uh, I again I'm getting a sense of being able to move quite well um, and economically. A okay, follow-up question for that is has lockdown improved your improved your enthusiasm or diminished it? Improved because wow. well be, because when I was preparing for Nida and I had you occasionally Simon I had Scott when I could find a course to go to and I had Apart from that, training by myself every day, training with Bill, you know, who's quite eclectic. And then I had Kanazawa school with Eska and I had the JKA and they're very different. Now, I, because I'm joining the instructors training in the morning, I get, I get access to Scott Sensei five times a week, sometimes six times a week, sometimes. And I get what he's after, but also I'm able to do karate at home. I'm able to do other stuff. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I'm not traveling anymore, so I can do it at home and out in the garden and I'm, com I'm completely motivated to do it my the drugs I'm on for my cancer make my bone and muscle mass deteriorate quite fast so I need to do a lot of exercise to, to keep it so I'm highly motivated to do stuff that gives me strength and conditioning and I have a very strong sense that you know time is short good answer thank you it's better, it's better I, for me I I, I, like... I'd love to do some kumite <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, like, uh, I think, you know, because I like knowing your background, um, and it's kind of quite a, well, it's, you, you know, Matthew's 
your background's not not academic. It's not that you've been stuck in academia all your life, but certainly you would you would be an academic type of person. Yeah. And and often that kind of like like you were saying, formulaic yeah. uh, kind of thought process produces sometimes kind of quite rigid and regimented thought processes, which inevitably I found produces stiff bodies as well. Yeah. And uh, I think that that um, that ability to you know, because the, the mind is so plastic, mm. you know, like like to, the, ability, the ability to change your thinking and change your approach also changes your body. Yeah. Um, so I, I think like it's 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 great that you've uh, managed to break that kind of uh, I don't know uh, esoteric level, you know, and move move up a level. It's important. Yeah, I am. I am. Um, I, um, I mean, I, I see karate as a vehicle for some, you know, quite profound personal change if you choose to make it so. Yeah. And I see people who I see a lot of people who do, and I have some very profound conversations with them over a beer, and I see a lot of people. And that's not why they do it, and that's fair enough. But we don't have such long conversations. Yeah. yeah. Hey Scott, so can I ask you? Can I turn that same yeah. question on you? Because I've noticed recently lots of happy karate with you on YouTube. Yeah. Literally, yeah, you can yeah. feel your energy fire, bubbling, isn't it? bubbling yeah. up the screen. So I mean, um, what? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, lockdown is. You know, you've embraced lockdown, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, like I, I've hated lockdown, and at the same time, loved it. I've, I hate lockdown, but I've loved the consequences. If, if you know what I mean. So yeah. I think this has been a, a, an exceptional time for, for growth. And I don't know if it's an exceptional time for growth because I've been growing or everybody else has been shrinking. You know, you know what I mean? Like some people have shrunk away and kind of just like, okay, I'm going to batten down the hatches. I'll see you yeah, in a yeah. time. Uh, and so then the difference is, but um, and I, I don't mean that in a physical way. I mean that quite in lots, lots of different ways. But um, yeah, I, I, think, I think you have to, you have to project a lot more when you're on Zoom anyway. And, and so that's been heightened. It's been ramped up to kind of, you know, level 11 rather than yeah, like where it was. Yeah. But um, yeah, I like, I, I'm enjoying my training. Like, I, And also because I'm not traveling, I'm less tired, you know, I, I physically feel a lot better. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've embraced it. And it's, it's been a, it's been an exceptional time for, for, for growth in, in lots of different ways. So uh, Would you say like, you've done more research? Because, I mean, you're doing loads, coming up with new stuff, lots of really good stuff, like a lot of it recently. Like, you know, the little clip with, with when you're doing Techie, uh, Junro Shodan Bunkai with Rue, you could just feel you pinging out the room. It was joyous. It was lovely. Yeah. And then all the breathing stuff you did, it was nice. Yeah, I was, I, I was talking about this too. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I cheated on you, but I did another podcast with the boys. Oh, so, Good. <laughs> uh, but I was it was never was supposed to be a monogamous I haven't listened to that yet. I must, admit, I must catch up with it. So much to uh, listen to. So yeah, I, did, I was doing I was doing that with them, uh, and I think they just released it. But uh, they, I was saying to them, like normally my my, you know, my cycle would, of production of kind of material would be, uh, you know, I'd, I'd teach in, I'd teach the Mondays and Thursdays that I teach in my own class. And then I, at the weekends, I'd be traveling most weekends and I'd be kind of building up until I got kind of a weekend's material and I'd kind of perfect it over like maybe a couple of month period until I'd ultimately get bored of it, bored of my own voice. And so then I'd, in the meantime, in the background, I'd be building up other material and, you know, a bit like, you know, like a bit like a stand-up comic, I guess, you know, like you're, you're constantly using existing material and then working on new material and, and and ultimately at some point you know the new material kind of overtakes the old material and, and you know and, it, and even that process and and I, it used to culminate every year in in the the norwegian summer camp right yeah. uh, you know and, and i used to like go to norway every year and, and teach there like not anymore i don't <laughs> but, uh, i used to for 40 years scoundrel like, yeah, 14, 15 years, 15 years, I think I did it every year. And so that used to be the, the culmination of four day seminar, like lots of senior grade classes. And I used to kind of have probably about, I don't know, I, I used to have like maybe four weekends worth of really highly polished kind of material that I cherry pick and go, right, this is my new season. You know, and, and it got to the point where, like, people would mention that and say, oh, so what, I wonder what Scott's new season's going to be this year. What's he going to talk about this year? And every year, every, for 15 years, it used to be different, 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 every year. Uh, and, and so I used to do that over a year period, whereas now, 
that's not happening. Now it's been condensed with Zoom. It's condensed to like a week. That year process has been squeezed down to week. But instead of me doing kind of like four hours a day for four days, I'm now doing 45 minutes on one day, so to speak, you know? And so yeah. I'll be teaching Zoom classes you know, Mondays and Thursdays, I'll be doing the, you know, instructor's training Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mornings, and we'll be talking about stuff, I'll be th we'd thinking about things, blah, 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 and then come the Saturday Zoom class or the, the Sunday seminar, like uh, yesterday I did two seminars, then, boy, I'd produce something. And then, you know, this week I'm teaching a, a course for a uh, Ukrainian group uh, next weekend. I'm going to spend this week thinking, right, what I'm going to do, what we're thinking of, blah, blah, blah. And and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just been put into hyperdrive, and, uh, and that's what I'm doing now, yeah. Good, it's, it's, it's good. Simon Centre, can I ask you though about Zoom? Because I, I, I sense a, an ambivalence towards it. Is that the right Yeah, word? I, I think maybe, I just find Zoom maybe, maybe it's just where I am in my life at the moment. Mm. You know, I mean, I find it a little bit alienating. Mm. Mainly because I'm not, I'm not enjoying lockdown. I'm a people person. I'm very, I spent my whole life with people entertaining people and i find that disconnect with zoom makes me a bit sad you know like I'm, i feel acutely aware of being on my own in a room mm. doing karate and i i, I i'm I, yeah I, I don't need, I, yeah i struggle with it at the moment it's interesting because because you know i do executive coaching i i yeah. in order to create connection with a person in a room i yeah. i throw an imaginary sort of cloak over both of us so even if we're doing it in a coffee station in a, a coffee house in a station it's yeah. still just me and them together and i've had to adopt a similar mental and physical symbolic approach to coaching people on zoom i find it easier to teach on zoom than to train on zoom right because i'm training on zoom i can kind of because i've done you know as a stand-up comic for 30 years i've done you know the best stand-up comedy gigs were like someone at a comedy store or theaters yeah where everyone it's dark room that cloak yeah. really resonates the best comedy clubs always had low ceilings yeah, and the, you know, and the, you're close to the front, so I yeah. find teaching on Zoom far. Uh, it's still yeah. trickier, but I mean that kind of suits my personality. Yeah. Yeah. But I find training on Zoom, I find it hard to keep the energy going. So, so, so if, if anyone teaches on Zoom and they, they maybe talk a bit too much or yeah. don't yeah. don't yeah. Uh, keep the pace going and don't count, I think you know I think Scott's got it kind of right, and hopefully I've got it right. I dictate the pace, I dictate the energy, I give to them. But anyone who sometimes yeah. isn't clear what I need to do, I tend to shift. And then suddenly I'm standing in my house yeah. feeling a bit. It's, it's funny you say that because I've noticed that. And I just think, well, sorry, I'll do some ankle flexibility now. Well, I'd rather know, go for a run. Away. Yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. rather train on my own. Like to, yeah. I, mean, you know, train to, I mean, I do train. I kind of, but that's just me, you know. Maybe it would help I, I, if, I had a big, if I had a big telly on the wall, like you've got it, you know, the dojo. Yeah, I, I have to say, though, like, the only way I, I, I you know, because obviously Simon and I are kind of like, you know, very similar. <laughs> and if I, uh, if I was doing what I was doing by myself, I think I would have run out of energy a long time ago. It's the fact that I've got Ross, Rue, AJ, yeah. Yeah. and, you know, occasionally a few others, who are there kind of like i haven't taught a seminar by myself yet no, and, uh, and I, I i don't know if i could but just to have that even even simple things like rue doing the warm-up yes yeah. yeah, nice I, yeah I, I don't think i could function i mean it sounds really kind of OCD. i don't think i could function if i was like okay you're okay ray or yeah. and then have to start straight away no give me seven minutes yeah. that's all i need seven minutes to go through my stretch whilst yeah. i i you know i have this i have this thing maybe i'm this is non-alcoholic beer so i don't know why I'm, I'm sharing so much but i have this thing that um like I have, i've started taking cold showers in the morning yeah. and uh for a variety of reasons that yeah i can explain if you want me to there's, but, a, there's a joke in that somewhere isn't there simon yeah. funakoshi sensei recommended cold showers every morning he did, okay. he did yeah but I have this, you live to like 99 or something. <laughs> I have this thing that, like, I'll take a normal shower and the last 30 seconds to a minute, it'd be kind of as cold as possible. Yeah. And I have this thing where, kind of, I look, there's a, in the shower, it's got a marble, blah, 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 kind of thing. And there's a, there's a kind of scent pan. I'll look at the pattern, take a deep breath, and then turn it onto cold. 
and they don't react. And then it goes cold, and I've called, and it's like that kind of like visual psychological pattern that puts me in the place to do what I'm going to do. And it works like that. And to the point where massive headache, ice headache, numb chest. Yeah. Because uh, it's just like coming down there. And then I go, I have to say, yeah, that's enough now, Scott. And then I get out. So my point is, my point is, is that like that's that process, and I do that quite a lot, that process, that's the same as what I do with the warm-up. Okay, yeah. Bow, okay, I'm going to do this, and this will get me to the point where I go, hello, right, it's me, and I'm going to teach you karate for an hour. Always. Yeah. I, I miss the old, I mean, when in the, in the old days in karate, we'd always do this like 10, 15 minute warm up, head forward and back side to side. And I always started my classes doing it. And I always enjoyed it. Going to a class, I knew it was going to happen. In Gojiru Jumbo they always do the same thing. Yeah. And it just get, gets you into the zone. It just yeah. gives, buys you that time before you start. In the world of hour long karate classes, that's hard to do. Yeah. But I, I love, you know, I mean, I'd love to do like a 15-minute 15, 15 warm-up before every class if I could. It, it is interesting, Simon, Sensei, isn't it, that you, um, that there's two strands here. One is Zoom and lockdown and, and being by yourself. But there is also, you know, your slightly throwaway, but actually probably quite profound point about time of life, isn't there? Because your daughter has gone off to university. You're, well, I live you, on my own as well. So yeah, I, I, I um, live on my own. So my, my, I miss people. Yeah, there's a there's an existential dimension to this, isn't there, as well as a practical? Yeah, I mean, what saved me is Rick Jackson's. You know, Rick Jackson said, I am, you know, doing loads of Zen stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I, I ran for one hour, one hour to 40 minutes today. And mm. I tried to, I was doing Zen running. If I, I was trying to do Zen running, but I mean, mm. it, was, it was really, really good. Great, you know, so I, I'm, I'm doing lots of training, but just on my terms, really. Yeah. Yeah, you know, not you know, and um, but yeah, so yeah, but I'm dying for it to end. Yeah. Well, it's getting close, isn't it? We'll be able to go outside fairly yeah. soon. No, I mean, no, I mean properly. End. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, sat in the pub with you and him Absolutely. talking, That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, well, this, that'd be really nice. This summer it will happen. Don't you worry. Yeah, and also being in a dojo, I want to be in the dojo with people. I mean, it's a year, isn't it? Okay, well, rather than, uh, rather than lamenting on uh, on our sorry position, uh, is there any other questions? We've been going for an hour, so if there's any other questions that we can finish off with a big hurrah. So, Matthew, you haven't asked anything. Oh, I yeah. know I haven't. I'm very conscious of that, and I and I and I apologize. I was going to ask you, Scott, the same the same question to Simon because you are on fire when you come on. It's like you're stepping onto stage and you've thought about it, and you are holding a international audience of you know 40 people sometimes and more you know, more <laughs> I, are you are you um when when you're done is there a sort of um adrenaline rush and then you come down and you're you're exhausted you know do you sort of wilt like a lettuce leaf 10 minutes after you're done uh no i, I don't no like there is definitely a Oh, okay, relax. Yeah. Uh, but but actually, that adrenaline is still kind of kicking in, you know. And so so uh, like like yesterday would be a classic example. I taught I taught uh, two seminars. The first one was for Netherlands. Yeah. And uh, that was and great. It, I attended that one. Yeah. And it was for fifty minutes long. Yeah. And then then I had a 10, 15 minute break. And then I taught one for the, the World Karate and Martial Arts Organization. And that was all different styles uh, from all over the world. Uh, and that, that was 45 minutes long. And so I taught basically from, from uh, four o'clock until six o'clock with a, with a 10 minute break in between. And, uh, and I was kind of really tired but also kind of really revved up and 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 then Rue was helping me and seems we're in a support bubble uh he came back to to my house and we had uh dinner tour cooked us a lovely dinner and we had a a, a few a nice few glasses of of wine and uh and also half a bottle of champagne that i've just finished off uh, but the point is is that like i was like okay 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 oh, oh, okay and by by 10 o'clock when he when Rue went home i was like okay now i'm finally relaxed you know but uh yeah i think that the amount that i have to get kind of 
engaged and riled up from projecting that energy across the Zoom, across the world, is, uh, is, is really a level that I've never had to experience yeah. before. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is where it have parallels with Simon Sensei, because he'll be driving back having been hyper in a club, oh, and yeah. he's going to drive 150 miles, and I can imagine there's that sort of gradual... You drive really of... fast. The rule was never to, when you finish the gig, never just get in your car. You have, right, to, like, okay. you have to have a quick decompression, otherwise you get done for speeding. Yeah. I, but then I, you mustn't I, drink either. It's very yeah, yeah, I, have one, I yeah. have one, two pints I used to have. That was my rule. I have a pint. Yeah, I, I, I used to lecture a lot. Yeah. But I, I'm the question for both of you is do you do you think it's going to go back to the way it was before? But perhaps even more pertinent, do you want to go back to the karate lifestyles you had before lockdown? Because you, well, Scott, since they were away forty weeks yeah. of the year, you, Simon, were you know running running up and down the country doing gigs and karate. Well, and... I don't do gigs anymore, so that's right. that's changed. I'm looking. I, I I'm definitely looking forward to teaching karate and training. I miss training more than anything. I've got, you know, I'm going to train when in dojos. I uh, I just like last week actually was a was a bit of a, a crazy week in terms of taking bookings. So I took bookings for uh, the end the la the last week of August, and everything was booked. Like I got took bookings from the last week of August until the first week of October. So like six weeks of seminars like that and uh i was like yeah yeah and they all like like basically six groups contacted me and said we want dates yep. in the, at the end of summer beginning of autumn type thing and so the six weeks just went like like booked out and i looked at it thinking geez that's six weekends away yeah that i'm not i'm just not used to and i've got i i, I was thinking that i've got to be really careful about my energy levels because i don't know how mm. how i'm going to cope with that and Maybe I should just give myself a week off after, at the beginning of October time. Uh, and yeah, like uh, I'm really looking forward to it and I'm really looking forward to kind of getting back to stuff. At the same time, I think, okay, I need to, I need to kind of just address how, how I do that because I don't think I can go back to doing 45 weekends again. Well, that, but you can keep on doing Zoom, can't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the international Zoom things that we've done have been amazing. I mean, the one with yeah. Guillaume Morad and uh, Felipe, it's yeah. just, just fantastic. So they, they can still, they, we can still yeah, do that. For sure, yeah, we'll continue. Well, we, will, um, we will finish, we will finish on uh, a brief explanation of, of uh, Matthew's background. Okay, so in, in terms of my personal background, my no, history background. The Zoom background. Oh, that. <laughs> so, during, yeah, what is it? In between the first and second lockdown, we went with some friends to the Mulvern Hills. I don't know if you've ever been there. I hadn't. I no. have been. It's beautiful. Absolutely stunning. You know, geological abnormality. And we went there and one evening the other couple were cooking. So we, my wife Jane and I went up the hill just to, to go for a drive because the pubs weren't open or anything. And we got to the top of the, one of the hills and there was this blood red sunset. And this is a rather crude photo taken with my iPhone. But it was, I mean, that's incredibly Japanese, isn't it? I, I, it was no just filter. the most extraordinary scene. It was it was a quasi-spiritual experience, actually. The, and um, Matthew, the, there's no filter on that, is there? No. It's not been edited in any way? No. That's amazing. It, it is beautiful, isn't it? And the Mulvans are quite stunning. I mean, we're great walkers, Jane and I. We were out, you know, we went out today. And I just think um, connection with nature is beautiful. And you know, yeah, what, my the, thing about lock, so got it, the, the most astonishing thing about that story is that you managed to get a picture like that from an iPhone. Yes, I mean it's it's a good it's iPhone, but it's still an iPhone, you know, because they're crap. <laughs> so, uh, uh, right the way. Okay. my apologies if I've talked too much and not asked you questions. I just, I get as you can tell, I, once I get going, I get going. You've um, stolen my thunder, Matthew. I hate I know. you. Are you? Are you? Am I? Am I in the doghouse now? It's then? good. It's good to get me shot. I talk too much. Well, before before we get to do that, let's let's finish with a, a toast. So, yeah. thank you, gentlemen, Matthew. Thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Thank you, Matthew.